My name is Emily Kane. I am a friend of Dr. Lown, fan of Lewiston and Auburn, and I'm so glad to be here tonight to be the MC for tonight's portrait unveiling. Before we start, please join me in thanking Rabbi Dresner and Lisa Meyer, and I just heard it called the Rabbi's Family Band. Please thank the Rabbi for the music you see. Thank you so much. This is such a special event. We are here tonight to honor Dr. Bernard Lown, a man who has given so much, not only to Maine, to our country, but to our world. And we are here tonight to celebrate him in a very specific way. Now let's remember, and you all have Dr. Lown's bio in your program. This is someone who has invented the direct current defibrillator. He has been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. He has the bridge named for him here, the Peace Bridge. He has numerous buildings and awards and scholarships named for him. But tonight, we will add something so special that Dr. Lown, his portrait painted by Robert Shetterly, will become part of the Americans Who Tell the Truth portrait collection. And that's what we're here tonight for. Personally, I met Dr. Lown about 25 years ago. I was an undergraduate student at the University of Maine in the Honors College, and Dr. Lown came to campus, and I got to meet him. I was pretty amazed from the very beginning that someone who had accomplished so much had started in the halls and the classrooms that I was in as a student at the University of Maine. I learned about his life, his immigrant family, his journey in this community, his journey to the University of Maine and beyond. But it was when I had the chance to go to Boston with some other UMaine people, I was probably 20 years old, um, and I got to sit next to Dr. Loud at a small dinner. That was the night Dr. Loud and I became friends. In fact, that was the night he told me that I, well, it was really lovely that I was so passionate about education and studying education, I should really forget all of that and go directly into politics. <laughs> I laughed at him that night and was very flattered that someone like him could think of me in that way, having no idea that a few years later I would get elected to the state legislature here in Maine, serve for 10 years. Thank you. And it is not untrue, in fact it's factual to say that Dr. Lown is one of the first people in my life that ever planted the seed of that type of public service for me. He had such an impact on my life and on so many others. And I know there are endless stories in this room tonight, and we will share some of them at the microphone and even more of them afterward at the reception. Today, some of you might have listened to Maine Calling, and it was an amazing call-in show on Maine Public Radio. You can clap for that. Yeah. That really showed the full spectrum of Dr. Lown's impact, his focus on healing, his focus on community, the incredible legacy he leaves, not only in his life's work um, and inspiration, but also in his family. And for me, I found myself listening and feeling my own connection to him, that friendship and mentorship that I developed with him over multiple decades really come to light. And tonight, we are celebrating it for all of us. We are pleased, uh, lucky, to have many distinguished speakers tonight. I want to recognize in the audience, at the risk of leaving people out, I am going to do this, um, excuse me in advance, uh, we have both mayors here, Mayor Carl, Carl Shaleen of Lewiston and Jeff Harmon of Auburn are in the audience tonight. Thank you to both the mayors for being here. And I did spot my dear friend, uh, Representative Margaret Craven and State Senator Peggy Rotundo, here as well um, in the crowd. Thank you both for being here. And if I missed you and you have a title that I should have introduced, please come see me and I'll, talk, I'll work you in before the end. Um, Governor Janet Mills couldn't be here tonight, but she sent a beautiful letter that I will be passing along to the family. Um, but in her letter, she talks about Dr. Lown's life, Dr. Lown's impact, as we've all known through his, through his life and his work, and she says, Maine people can and should be proud of Dr. Lown's countless contributions to the world we know today. 
Despite knowingly hurting his own career, he spoke up for what he knew was right, a virtue we should all aspire to. And I know this will come up at some point tonight, so I'm gonna do it now. Janet Mills is actually the one who nominated Dr. Lown for the innovator coin that the US Mint just put out, um, which, it, which is now available. And she sends her very best. In fact, I'm wearing the coin as a necklace, so check it out before the night's over. So we are featured, so we're, we're, we tried tonight in a, in a world full of many people who could talk about Dr. Lown to offer three speakers tonight that can show us different parts of his impact and why he is being celebrated this way as part of Americans Who Tell the Truth. We have three speakers that I have the pleasure of introducing. First, we have Dr. Joan Farini Mundy, who is the president of the University of Maine. She's the 21st president of the University of Maine and its regional campus, the University of Maine at Machias, starting in 2018. In 2021, she was also appointed the University of Maine System Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation, where she leads a formalized effort to make UMaine's research infrastructure accessible and supportive of all universities in the system. Thank you to Dr. Lowndes' alma mater, President John Freeney Mundy. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so very much for including me. What an honor to be able to come to this unveiling and to celebrate Dr. Bernard Lown and his remarkable contributions. Dr. Lown graduated from the University of Maine in 1942, and I noticed in the bio he apparently started on a trial basis at the <laughs> University of Maine. Can't imagine what that was about, but he graduated with a bachelor's degree from the College of Arts and Sciences in Zoology and is an alumnus of our Honors College. Dr. Lown was awarded an honorary Doctor of Science degree in May of 1982 from the university. He provided over many, many years unique mentorship and guidance to students. We've already heard from Emily Kane. He helped her start her career in politics and countless others of uh, the University of Maine community were affected by his legacy of innovation, medicine, and humanitarianism. It has shaped and continues to shape the scholars and problem solvers of tomorrow, particularly through the University of Maine. I never had the good fortune to meet Dr. Lown, but I learned about him the minute I arrived on campus over the years, he came to campus on multiple occasions to deliver presentations on topics ranging from medicine and innovation to global peace and nuclear disarmament. He wanted to make a difference in the world, and he did. He inspired our students to make their own paths, and in his words, he saw, them, he saw people as the ultimate arbiters of their own destinies. Bernard Laun and his family have made generous contributions that have expanded the educational opportunities to our students at the University of Maine. Most recently, the university received a substantial gift from the family to the Honors College in honor of their father's lifelong work. This will support a thesis fellowship and an Honors College teaching professorship, and we are very, very grateful to the family for their support of, of Dr. Laun's alma mater. And we are very grateful. We know that the Americans Who Tell the Truth, pr Truth Project is committed to um, modeling the commitment to act for the common good in the honors that they provide for folks with these portraits. And we are so very, very proud that Dr. Bernard Lown and the time that he spent, uh, of Dr. Lown and the time that he spent at the University of Maine, which we assume was a foundation for his future accomplishments, we are honored to have him as an alumnus of the University of Maine and to be able to represent the university here tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Joan. That was beautiful. Next up is someone that really needs no introduction in this community, but someone who knew Dr. Lown very well in his later years and, again, really is without the need for introduction in this community, the former mayor of Lewiston and friend to Dr. Lown, Larry Gilbert. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Emily said, uh, my name is Larry Gilbert, and um, how I first heard of Dr. Bernard Lown is from a gentleman who is a Bates College graduate, uh, a, 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 a track star, record holder at Bates College, and uh, who is here with us today. And none of us would be here if it weren't for him. 
but it's uh, Al Harvey, and Al is wearing their Bates colors. <laughs> I'll tell you how this came about, because I was officiating at track meets at Bates College, and Al was the announcer, and we were having lunch. And he said, I heard Dr. Bernard Lowndes speak at a commencement uh, in uh, 1989 at Bates College, and he says, we have the South Bridge between Lewiston and Auburn. It's the green one when you, if you cross. And uh, it's simply called the South Bridge. We used to have the North Bridge. It's now the Longley Bridge after Governor Longley. And he says, I think it should be named after Dr. Lowndes told me about it. So we went to work. Uh, we formed a committee. Uh, and we worked with our legislative delegation. Uh, and it, the bill flew through the legislature, and uh, Governor Baldacci signed, signed the bill naming the bridge, the Bernard and Lionel Peace Bridge. So when Al first talked to me, I, I called the Alumni Association, and they had his phone number and address. I said, great, because I didn't know if he was still alive. He, he was 86 at the time. So I called, and this elderly woman answered. I said, may I speak to Dr. Lau? She said, just a moment. Ooh, wow. <laughs> uh, so he came to the phone, and I told him I was mayor of Lewiston at the time, and that we wanted to name a bridge between the cities of Lewiston and Auburn in his honor. And we wanted to name it the Dr. Bernard Lau Peace Bridge. He said, I would be honored, but drop the doctor. So the doctor isn't on there. And so uh, we started talking. I said, uh, uh, I says, uh, your wife's name is Louise. And he said, yes. I said, my wife's middle name is Louise. How many children do you have? He said, I have two daughters and a son. I said, I have two daughters and a son. I said, I see your birthday is June 7th. I said, my birthday is June 7th. <laughs> and then, uh, being Jewish and from Lewiston, where Lewiston was a predominantly Franco-American community, I thought, well, this little Jewish boy married a French-Canadian girl, maybe. So I said, how did you meet your wife? He said, oh, that's a long story for another day. <laughs> I still wanted to know. So I asked him, I says, well, what was her maiden name? I figured I would find out that way. He said, wow. I said, did you marry a cousin? He said, yes. I said, so did I. <laughs> So my wife is back here in that little uh, wheelchair here. My wife, Pat. So, um, yeah, uh, there were so similarly, so we hit it off well, okay? And then uh, we, we formed a committee and uh, we had a wonderful celebration uh, in the day of the naming of the bridge in 2008. And uh, we had a, a band from uh, the high school. We had the glee clubs of, or whatever they're, they're called. I don't know, I call them glee clubs, but from Lewiston and Auburn together. And I think you'll hear a song that uh, they sang at the ceremony of the Franco-American Heritage Center. So it was, uh, it was excellent. But I have so many stories of Dr. Lowne, because we would meet with him in the summer at Sebago Lake at the family uh, cottage that was there, and he told me there were 5,000 books there. Now here's a man who read a lot. <laughs> no wonder he was so smart. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I'll leave it, and uh, if people want to talk to me after, I'd be glad to share stories, because there are stories. He's got a grandson named uh, Zach, who became a lawyer. So we're at Sebago Lake at the cottage, he says, Larry and where I was in law enforcement. He says, Larry, do you have any lawyer jokes? I said, yes, I have one. So I dictated a lawyer joke, 
and he wrote it down so he could use it on his grandson. So, <laughs> But this is just the type of man he was. He was down to earth, just a loving man. And by the way, behind that man was a wonderful woman. Her name is Louise. Louise Lowne. He called her Saint Louise because she was truly a saint behind him. She was the force behind him, but never receiving the accolades that she richly deserved. So I, ju I just want to remember her. And one last thing, I always call him on his birthday, because my birthday, I always remembered. <laughs> so uh, at 98, I'm on the phone with him, and he says, I'm writing my memoir. I says, oh, I want a copy of that. He says, well, I'm just writing it now. It's going to take me a couple of years. <laughs> so, so his granddaughter's finishing it, by the way. Oh, uh, and you're going to know. Yeah, OK. So. Thank you so much, Larry. And I can also attest, my husband and I visited Dr. Lown every summer, and, and usually at the holidays as well. And um, my husband is a great joke teller, Danny down in front. He's also available for jokes at the reception. But Danny and Dr. Lown would basically go have a side hustle every single meeting we got together so Dr. Lown could learn some new jokes that he could tell people. So it, it's a very appropriate story for tonight. Thank you so much, Larry. Uh, next up, we have a really special speaker uh, for here tonight. Doug Rawlings is here. Doug is a Vietnam veteran co-founder of the national organization Veterans for Peace, which today has thousands of members and more than 140 chapters world, worldwide. Doug is retired from the University of Maine Farmington. He lives here in Maine on a farmstead in Chesterfield, and he's here tonight representing Maine Veterans for Peace. be wary of an old guy heading to a podium with a sheet of paper. <laughs> <laughs> However, I have promised Emily that I will finish these remarks in exactly five minutes. All right? First of all, of course, it is a true, really an honor to be here. It really truly is. The year 1985 was a year that the Lewiston-Auburn community was brought into the international spotlight for those who were concerned about the threat of nuclear war. Three events took place in this small, humane, small Maine township in that fateful year that would change the world forever. Unfortunately, the first event was a tragedy. In the summer of 1985, America's youngest peace ambassador, Samantha Smith, died in a plane crash at the Auburn Airport at the age of 13. The Russian poet Julia Dunina wrote this of Samantha, quote, Samantha, you are like a little star flashing over the planet on a sky covered with dark clouds under, under the stare of kind and evil eyes. But Samantha believed that it was still not too late to save the earth. Today we stretch our arms out to all your friends, Samantha." End quote. Samantha, like Dr. Long, knew that breaking across political artificial boundaries to touch the lives of Russian citizens could do more than any political posturing could do to end the threat of nuclear war. Although her physical presence is gone, she still resides in our hearts and spirits. Also in the summer of 1985, five intrepid souls gathered at a table in Denny's restaurant here in Lewiston, Auburn to officially sign the incorporation papers of the international group Veterans for Peace. We dedicated our lives to using our experiences as military veterans to abolish war and to do so nonviolently. In the spirit of Dr. Long, we sent our first international contingent of American veterans to the Komi Republic in the former Soviet Union to meet with Russian veterans from their recent war in Afghanistan. We who fought in Vietnam felt a strong connection to our fellow Russian veterans. All of us survivors of, of wars that never should have been waged that caused unimaginable tragedies that continue into today. To continue our spiritual connection to Dr. Lown, our main chapter of Veterans for Peace formed a sister relationship with a chapter of the Comey Russian veterans. In our statement of collaboration, we wrote, quote, 
As citizens of our respective countries, we will no longer bear arms against each other, nor will we support either government's attempts to militarize diplomacy between our two great countries. As veterans of the United States and Russian military forces, we hereby forswear any attempts to revise historical accounts to glorify war. We will step forward to set the record straight when necessary." End quote. You can imagine the interesting times we're having right now. Unfortunately, my connection with the uh, president of that chapter has been stopped. I hope it's going to come back again. So we gather today to recognize Dr. Bernard Long, who in December of 1985 was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. In that fateful year, he accepted this most prestigious honor with his usual eloquence. As a cardiologist of some renown, he said, quote, to me, you cannot be committed to health without being engaged in social struggle for health. The international community concerned about the fate of this planet Earth grew by leaps and bounds that year of 1985 as Dr. Lown uh, stepped to the podium. But we must also remember that Dr. Lown was an amazing teacher as well as being a scientist. In a documentary about Dr. Lown, some of his interns were asked about his influence on their lives. They said that among many of his contributions, Dr. Lown encouraged them to read widely and deeply. They at first thought he was referring to scientific journals, but Dr. Lown corrected them. No, he said, read novels. I see that advice as a really getting to the soul of this remarkable man, counseling future cardiologists to not just think of the human heart as a biological organ, but think of it as a dwelling place of the human spirit. So with that thought in mind, I'd like to close with a short poem I wrote from many years ago for my children. It's immodestly entitled, How to Prevent Nuclear War. I got the answer right here. It begins with, an, with this Native American aphorism, quote, we have not inherited the earth from our ancestors, we have borrowed it from our descendants, end quote. I would now like to dedicate this poem to the spirit and memory of Dr. Bernard Lam, How to Prevent Nuclear War. We have not inherited the earth from our ancestors. We have borrowed it from our descendants. Give to each president, each prime minister, each admiral, each general an acorn. Tell them to plant it in a field that they will never see again. Tell them not to think about it. Rather, each morning before thoughts crowd in, tell them to feel it, to feel its roots stretching into the earth, to feel it aching toward the sun, to feel it breathing into the wind. Tell them to feel it swinging with the laughter of their children's children. Thank you, Dr. Long, for your contributions to our lives. Your spirit lives with us. How beautiful and, and how special. Um, our next presentation is also going to be beautiful and special. Um, as the former mayor said when the Lown Bridge was dedicated, Lown Peace Bridge was dedicated here many years ago, I was here. I walked the bridge with Dr. Lown and so many of you as we dedicated that in, in that incredible moment. Um, and that night, the Lewiston High School Chamber Choir uh, did sing, and tonight we are fortunate to be joined by members of that same choir who will perform Let There Be Peace on Earth.
a little emotional on that one. That was so beautiful. Thank you so much to those members of the Lewiston High School Chamber Choir. One more round of applause, please. After I graduated from the University of Maine, I had the honor of working in the Honors College for about the next 14 years. In the first year I worked there, we established something called the John M. Resendez Visiting Scholar in Ethics. This person is a scholar who can address ethical issues of national importance. The visitor is invited to come to campus and conduct seminars with students and present a public lecture. In 2008, the Resendez visiting scholar was Dr. Bernard Lown, who spoke on activism in an ailing world. One year later, the visiting scholar was none other than Robert Shetterly who brought several portraits to campus and spoke on the ethic of collateral damage. I remember both of those, and I remember how powerful they were. Little did I know that tonight we would be bringing those two things together. The Americans Who Tell the Truth portrait series and Robert's other series of paintings have given him the opportunity to speak with children and adults all over the country about the necessity of dissent in a democracy, the obligations of citizenship, sustainability, US history, and how democracy cannot function if politicians don't tell the truth, if the media don't report it, and if people don't demand it. We are now at the big moment, my friends. Please join me in welcoming Maine artist and truth teller, Robert Shetterly. <laughs> Thank you very much, and um, I need to say some other thank yous before saying anything else. Is this space that we're in that belongs to um, the T Tom Platts, the architect and owner of it, who has been spending the last 25 years redeveloping and, and, and building so beautifully in here, uh, has let us use this space um, just with his own generosity. And I want to thank him, and we should all thank him. He's unfortunately not here tonight. But <clears throat> he will be here in November. We're planning, this will be the, the second time only, in this very space on these two levels, show the entire collection of Americans Who Tell the Truth portraits. There are now over 275 portraits, and they will be building special walls to hang all these portraits on. And we'll be doing a lot of events here, some with the portrait subjects and with a lot of sc with schools. And I'm so grateful to the support that uh, Tom has given us, and where is Doreen? Is she, Doreen here? Uh, I can't see, but anyway, she's back there. But anyway, she, she works with Tom, and if any of you have questions about him or this space or you know, that, that work they're doing, you can ask, you can talk to her. Other people, I just want to thank the, uh, Emily, I want to thank Larry, I want to thank Doug, I want to thank you know, everybody who has contributed to this, and you'll hear from Emma shortly. Um, this is, you know, we thought of doing this little event here to honor Dr. Lau, and we thought there might be you know, a handful of folks, and it would be a kind of little uh, thing that was here and then gone, you know? And instead, you all are here, and I'm just so pleased. Um, I don't think I knew about uh, Dr. Lau at all until uh, maybe about a year ago when I was at a Veterans for Peace event down in Portland and Larry was there and I met Larry for the first time and he suggested to me, um, rather emphatically, that, um, <laughs> that maybe uh, painting Dr. Lau would be a really good idea. And I had no idea, you know, kind of what I was getting into and what an extraordinary man he was and what extraordinary history. Uh, not only he was part of, but what he created. And uh, it's, if, if some of you, uh, today when we were doing this radio program, there, there was a lot of conversation about his book about, what's it called, the how to? Art the Lost, the lost, the lost art, art of Healing. The Lost Art of Healing, yeah. Which is about <coughs> how a doctor's manner and, and with a patient uh, can have a, such a huge effect on the healing of that patient and the psychology of it as well as uh, just the, the things you wouldn't does. And what they didn't talk about was his book, Prescription for Survival, which tells in great detail all the story of the time when he started Physicians for Social Responsibility, 
way back in 1960, and then up through the founding of physicians for uh, international physicians for the prevention of nuclear war in 1980. And it's so full of the extraordinary moments that he had, the things that he did, you know, meeting world leaders all over the, the world. And, you know, lobbying so hard with the hundreds of thousands of doctors, he got involved in that movement to try to disarm this world of nuclear weapons. You know, about you know, his work as a doctor, he was saying, yes, it's really important that we treat a, you know, a person at a time and do this work with the, the cardiovascular work and uh, you know, try to treat the heart and stuff. But he thought that his primary duty you know, as a healer was to save the world from destroying itself, to actually save not just a person at a time, but you know, whole countries at a time. In fact, all species at a time. He knew that, and, and this is what he did, you know, starting back in the late 60s, was try to impress people that this, what our governments are doing when they are talking about you know, using nuclear weapons and <laughs> perhaps winning a nuclear war was an absurdity and an atrocity. That is not, that is not what would happen. You know, billions of people would die instantly, billions more would die slowly. And that doctors like himself, if he happened to survive, would have no ability, zero, to treat anybody for their wounds, for their pain, for anything. And he thought that his responsibility was to try to keep that from happening. There wasn't a cure, so the, the effort must be put in prevention. And so that's what um, you know, the International Physicians Group was all about, was trying to be that prevention. And you know, as remarkable as this life is, um, it's also kind of a tragedy that his big heart and his, all that effort got actually so close around 1990 when Gorbachev was head of the Soviet Union. Gorbachev actually was on board. He met with, he liked Dr. Lown, they became good friends. He loved the idea of actually disarming. It was the United States that would you know, refuse to go along. It could have happened at that moment. I mean, just that whole burden could have been lifted. Anyway, I want to um, say a couple more things. I mean, I, what I brought is portraits that are sort of related to him one way or another. Uh, right here, Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha. She was the first Lown. Uh, is it the Honors College Award or Lown Institute? What, what is the award from UMO or UM? Humanitarian Award, maybe? She, she got the Lown Award from the yeah. University of Maine. She was the first one. And if you don't remember who she is, uh, she is the doctor from, pediatrician from Flint, Michigan, who blew the whistle on the lead in the water there, and has also continued to do such wonderful work for, uh, <clears throat> for that community, and inspired the cleanup of lead and, and water all over the country now, and replacing, which will take years and years, all the lead pipes. Over there is the portrait of Samantha Smith, you know, who was, as, as Doug mentioned, you know, was alive in 1985, and you know, died in 1985. In 1983, you know, she was the one who wrote the letter to Yuri Andropov saying, you know, this is crazy. Why would we possibly have a nuclear war when it could kill everything? And was invited to the Soviet Union. And the reason that, the, the, I don't think they ever met each other. He does talk about her in some of his writing. But the thing that she knew as an 11-year-old kid which he was trying to tell to so many adults, was that this manner we have of supposedly peacemaking by creating uh, demonized, dehumanized, evil enemies, and then all these weapons to put in, you know, in their face and threaten them with, is not the way to peace. The way to peace is to talk to other people, whoever they are how much, whatever you know, initial fear you have of, of them, is to talk to them and find your common humanity and figure out a way you know, to solve those problems without the possibility of destroying everything. I mean, you know, that's an insane thing. There was nothing sentimental or naive about Dr. Lown. He was not a person singing 
let's give peace a chance. He was saying, let's grab this thing and let's change it. We can't live like this. Uh, a couple other portraits I wanted to mention, you know, there's, back there is, is Daniel Ellsberg, you know, also a person that lived during that time and who just died last year. Uh, an amazing figure who took a different kind of risk to try to bring peace to the world, not the same risk as Dr. Lown, but was assuming that he would spend the rest of his life in jail for releasing the Pentagon Papers to, tell, for, to force the truth to be being told about the Vietnam War. Um, who else is back there? Oh, Jody Williams, you know, this, the, the, the Nobel Prize was actually given to the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. And Bernard Lown and Eugene Glassoff, who was the most prominent cardiologist in the Soviet Union, the two of them had worked closely together since 1966 to try to find a way to, to making peace and disarming their countries. Jody Williams was part of the group who won a, 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 a Nobel Prize for banning landmines. You know, so many landmines are not in the world now because of the work that was done by that group. And so she was one of the co-recipients of that. Uh, who else is here? Uh, can't remember. Oh, and I just wanted to mention that uh, one other one, and that's Francis Perkins. When, uh, when Bernard came to Lewiston in 1935 or 6, Francis Perkins was the Secretary of Labor. And, you know, the first woman who was ever in that position, uh, also the first uh, Secretary of uh, our Cabinet Officer who a, our Congress tried to impeach. And the reason they did that was because, uh, you know, she was, uh, all those things that we got in the New Deal, that we always say, well, those are FDR's ideas, they were not FDR's ideas, they were Francis Perkins' ideas. And her family, you know, actually has a connection to Damaris Scott and the Francis Perkins Center is there. But anyway, she was, at that time, talking about things the same way Dr. Lown did later, about the world is balanced in its future peacefulness on the dignity that is allowed or given or people are able to find in their lives you know, in terms of economic equality, healthcare, education, the, the wages they are paid for working an eight hour day, that if people live those kinds of engaged lives and work hard, they should be able to live as full citizens without having to have food stamps or feel disregarded or lesser than anything else. That that question of human dignity is maybe the thing of which peace balances. And Bernard Lown believed that completely, that, that you know, in, um, economic uh, equality was as important as anything else in our search for peace in the world. So I just want to um, just end with one little thing about his, and then we'll unveil the portrait. I'm, I'm actually always trying to avoid unveiling the portrait. It's like, oh my god! <laughs> but um, we just, I want to. I'm going to read this little part because uh, when I wrote it, I thought, well, I should read it just the way I wrote it. This was last night. Our reason for being here, at least my reason for painting this portrait is not really to celebrate the magnificent accomplishments of Dr. Lown. The most important thing we can do if we want to honor him is dedicate ourselves to carrying on his work, not as cardiovascular surgeons, only <clears throat> not as cardiovascular surgeons, but by insisting on the deep, courageous heart work of making peace and demanding ecological sustainability. The resistance to nuclear disarmament, militarism, as well as the resistance to changing policies bringing us to the brink of climate disaster are generated by the same forces, our own intransigent systems of politics, power, and profit. If history teaches us anything, it is that the centers of power will not release their grip till all the profit they desire is wrung out of this system. That will be too late. There is such a thing as being too late, as Dr. King reminded us. Lincoln's closing to the Gettysburg Address yearned for a new birth of freedom, that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. 
But entrenched power does not want that of, by, and for. And we know now that the earth itself may indeed perish if we don't embrace those three prepositions. That's our best hope. Bernard would surely agree. Our charge is to adopt his motto, never whisper in the presence of wrong. So thank you very much. And Emma, his granddaughter, will come up with me and we will unveil this portrait and then she will talk a little bit about it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for all of your remarks and stories and kind words. Um, my name is Emma, and I am the youngest grandchild of Dr. Bernard Vaughn. Um, thank you, Robert, for having us here at this wonderful event. I'm really happy to be here for this unveiling, especially here in Lewiston. Uh, this was a very, very special place for my grandfather. He first immigrated to Lewiston from a small town in Lithuania in 1935 at age 14, escaping anti-Semitism and the encroaching Nazi regime. He began high school in, Lu in Lewiston, only speaking Yiddish. Three years later, he was admitted into the honors program at the University of Maine. His experience there had a profound impact on him. It was of great importance to him that he could give back to this community that helped shape the trajectory of his life. I am proud to say that he established two funds at the University of Maine to recognize both students and faculty who advocate for social justice, strive to educate their communities, and emulate the humanitarian ideals he deemed critical and necessary. Grandpa was endlessly curious and interested in history, art, and literature. He read at least two to three books at a time. He always wanted to know what I was reading. And let me tell you, when I was a kid, I really loved to provide a lot of context. <laughs> uh, but he would patiently listen to my 17 chapter summaries. <laughs> my grandpa and my grandma Louise, his beloved wife of over 70 years, loved to see their children and grandchildren think critically, read prolifically, and engage in social activism. My grandpa often wanted to know in what ways were we impacting the people and world around us no matter the scope, in what ways we were performing acts of mitzvah. I remember him asking me one Sunday afternoon, Emma? what is your five-year plan? <laughs> In which I would respond, well, I don't know yet, Grandpa. I'm only six years old. <laughs> My grandpa has had many accomplishments, but I know he would be thrilled with this event specifically because of his love of art. What many people may not know about him was that he was a meticulous curator of autobiographical photo albums, he loved to catalog his travels around the world by including thousands of pictures, article clippings, and postcards that he would painstakingly paste into his collection of albums with dates, locations, and personal commentary. <laughs> he chronicled 50 or more years of his life and travels, including countless art exhibits in just over 100 albums. This exhibit, as the embodiment of who he was. Always concerned with how we could do better 
as people for the betterment of ourselves, our family, our community, and the world. I know that he would have been honored to be a part of this portrait collection of Americans who tell the truth, to see his portrait amongst the hundreds of inspirational people advocating for the pursuit of truth and social justice, many of whom he considered his own personal heroes. Thank you. What a special evening. Music, art, storytelling, almost joke telling. We've had so many perfect elements of a perfect night. I tried today to come up with my favorite Dr. Lowne story. And I couldn't because I had so many, right? There are so many things, this wise human, this amazing man, this incredible grandfather. I mean, Emma, you come from good stock, let's be very clear. Um, and we are also lucky to have, have, have a little piece of that. But when I think about the conversations I would have with Dr. Lowne, what I remember most was his always for and forever his impatience. Not with me personally, but with how quickly could we move forward? What were we doing? He always wanted to know, not what my five-year plan was, but what was I doing in the legislature or in my work in Washington, DC? What was I doing to make it better? And he probably thought I was a little too pragmatic at times, and I always thought he had great ideas, but we can't do everything at once. But there's one quote that I, had, I, did, I do have and carry with me that makes me think of him. And it comes out of uh, remarks he gave to the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War to the Executive Committee in January of 1992. At the end of his remarks, he says, finally, I continue to brim with pessimism about the past, which no one can alter. My optimism for the future remains undiminished since we can help shape it. And I think that is a perfect sentiment for all of us to take with us today is that we have a role to play. Whatever our role, whatever our job, whatever our community, we each have a role to play and something we can do every single day in the spirit of the life and impact of this incredible man of Dr. Bernard Lowne. And so I want to say thank you uh, to, doc, to, of course, not only to Dr. Lowne, to Emma, to Robert for, for bringing this to life, to Larry for your incredible recommendation of clearly um, of bringing uh, Dr. Lowne to Robert, to Doug for sharing his stories from Veterans for Peace, to the members of the Chamber Choir. I want to thank Tom and the Bates Mill community for, for having us here in this beautiful space that just gets, gets better every time. From Americans Who Tell the Truth, Connie Carter, Christy Gonzalez McCollum and their intern Anders Langren, who did a ton of work to make this event possible. Um, we want to definitely thank again our incredible musicians, Rabbi Dresner and Lisa Meyer, who will be playing again during the reception. And I also want to say thank you um, to, to each of you for being here. And afterwards, we're going to have a reception, and I hope each of you makes sure you tell whatever story you've got <laughs> to somebody you haven't met yet. That can be one little way you pay the, the story and life of, of Dr. Lowne forward today. I will put another plug in for the full presentation of the portraits. I know that I intend to come in November when they are here at the Bates Mill. All of you should make sure you find out when that is and come right back here to see all those portraits on display. And finally, you might have heard either on the radio today or here tonight that it's Larry's birthday. <laughs> and it's also Dr. Lowne's birthday. And we have a special treat here tonight because um, Doug with Maine Veterans for Peace and our, also Martha Spees with Peace Action Maine uh, came together to purchase some of the Lowne coins so that some of you could take them home tonight with all of you. And because we want to make it easy, we're going to make it a piece of cake. Oh yes, a piece of cake to get a coin. You're welcome, that's my joke, my whole joke. It's the only joke I have. And, and you, if you are someone who doesn't yet have a coin or you aren't planning to get one of your own, you can get one over, over here from my friend. Say hello, there you go, uh, to get your coin. But because it's a birthday, I don't think we could end this event without singing happy birthday. So I'm gonna ask you to join me in singing happy birthday to Larry and Dr. Lau. How's that? Can we do it? Are you in? Don't make me sing alone. Okay, ready? One, two. 
Oh, Larry, come on now. It's your birthday. <laughs> so Larry, come on. All right, ready? One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Larry and Dr. Lown. Happy birthday to you. Yay! Thank you all for being here. Please join us for a reception afterward. We are here to celebrate Dr. Lown and the amazing community where he got his start. Thank you and have a great evening.